Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to sort myself out with some water. That will be necessary. I'm afraid I will be talking a lot, but I believe that it's almost contractually obliged that we talk about data, right? That seems to be an absolute necessity. Everybody needs to talk about data at the moment, and I'm afraid I'm going to be doing the same, but hopefully in a little bit of a different way that you might be used to. So to typographically represent that, there's the word data. Um, but it is actually a big problem, right? So data. Uh, but I think one of the issues we have at the moment is that everybody's really shouting about data. It's data, 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 analytics, data. So to typograph, data. Um, we're going to talk to you about data. Now, when I talk about data and analytics to you, I suspect that you, part of you will be thinking, yeah, it's really important. It's really important. Data is really important. It's very impactful. It's having a huge impact on our business. It's very important. It's very important. We need to do it. It's very important. And then there's probably another little part of you going, I'm not sure we do it. I'm not sure we're doing it properly. I'm not sure we're doing it at all. Well, let me let you into a little secret. If you look around this room, these are your peers. These are people that do the same job as you. I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. They all think the same. <laughs> because no one's really doing it. Okay? And the reason for that, I believe, is that, and if there are people here from this function, I apologise, data and analytics has kind of become a bit of a marketing thing, where you talk about data and analytics, data and analytics, when a lot of the time what people are actually doing is reporting. They're gathering data, they're gathering information, they're just reporting, not actually doing any analytics not creating any insightful, actionable points to, to deal with, just gathering information. And it's my view that if you're looking for a needle in a haystack, you don't make a bigger haystack. And I'm afraid an awful lot of the people that we work with have spent the last four or five years making bigger and bigger haystacks. Okay, so if that feels somewhat similar to how you might be thinking about things, hopefully the session is for you. So, I want to ask you a little question. What is the most important thing that you believe better data would be able to improve for your business? So, if we can pop the poll up, I've kind of put it into three main areas. Administration, engagement, or cost management. So if we can get a little bit, oh, that's sparkling, didn't expect that. Um, so if we can get a little bit, little bit of insight into, uh, into what that is, engagement, cost management, administration, and see what it is that you guys feel. Okay, pretty strong. Uh, pretty strong support there or, or preference towards engagement. Okay, very interesting. Um, the reason I say I don't believe people are doing analytics properly isn't because I'm guessing we do know this and we knew this quite a long time ago because we asked. Um, so part of the work that we did with Reba when I was working for Buck, a Gallagher company rather than Gallagher, a Gallagher company now, um, was to ask a survey question um, or a, 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 a set of surveys uh, around technology. So if we can have a look at the next slide now, we'll see that what you guys actually said in terms of data supporting organisational objectives was very, very interesting. So have a look at some of those things on there and you'll see these are not massive unicorns of incredible kind of insight, there's some pretty basic stuff on here, actually being able to merge data sets. Ooh, <laughs> right? But look at what we were told. So the dark blue bar is would like it, don't have it. Look at that. Accessible and easy to comprehend dashboard, 70% of you out there, your peers, don't have that. So if you don't have it, relax. No one else does, okay? So I think that's a really important thing for us to get across. No one's doing it properly. So why is it important that we do it properly? Well, because it matters to your business. It has an impact on your business, and you need to be able to evidence that to get rid of some of these barriers. Again, I think this is pretty instructive. I think this is pretty insightful. This isn't me. This is you telling us this. 
Downloading data from the benefits platform is a huge barrier. <laughs> Downloading data. If you're in a situation where you can't do that easily, then, you know, have a look at your benefits platform. But if you're not in a position to be able to do that easily, how are you going to be able to do analytics properly? The answer is, you're not. And that's why most of you aren't. So an awful lot of people today and you know, over the last few weeks and months and years will have been telling you about how important data and analytics is. And I'm going to guess at some stage you kind of went, yeah, that sounds really important, but we don't even have that data. How many people in this room feel like they measure absence properly? OK, so look around the room. If you were worried about not measuring absence properly, look around the room. It's not happening properly. OK, and that's important because efficiency, cost and EVP matter to your business. And this is, again, what you guys have been telling us. Employee engagement and benefits increases efficiency. You spend the benefits, you spend the money and the benefits in the right way on what it is that people want. Improving the employee value proposition, massively important to organisations at the moment. Diversity and inclusivity in the workplace. These are the things that better data can give you. That's why it's really important that you get this right. But again, most of you are not. So we're going to talk today a little bit about how we can help get there. Um, this is an important point. Uh, I suspect this figure is actually higher now because a lot more of you have gone through your medical renewals in the last couple of months and that was quite a painful process to speak to finance about. Yes, that's uh, not very nice. Cost, okay, huge issue. So why is change slow? Why is it actually a real big problem? We think it's something to do with this. Now, when I say people aren't doing this right, that's the majority of people. We work with a number of companies who we think are doing it right. You know, just jump on our socials and you'll see we actually literally won quite a lot of awards for this last week when it came to benefits and technology. So we are literally award winning at this. But this is why we think this is taking a long time. So you start off with benefit management, ins, outs, who has what, right? You maybe move on to benefit planning. What should we have in place? What people do we have? That's kind of where we get. What do we legally need to have? What do we legally need to report? not analyze, report, you end up there, and then you think, well, hang on, how can I get, how can I see what's going to happen in the future? Oh, well, I'd need to, that gets a little bit difficult, that's really hard, well, but that would prove efficacy and ROI, that would be really, I'd love to be able to do that, but man, that's really difficult before we even get to data-driven insights, so what happens? You do number one, you maybe get to number two, boo, it all breaks down and you don't do any of those other things. We see it all the time. So my suggestion to, do, to you, forget impact analysis, forget efficacy and ROI, and skip to the end point. The reason being, when you get given tasks within your organization, how often do you get told how to do them? Not very often, right? You get told an objective to achieve. Our business wants to do this. We need you to do that. Achieve this objective. You don't get told how to achieve that objective. And you certainly don't get told and achieve that objective using PowerPoint, Excel, and email. Think of data the same way. It is not a thing in and of itself. It is a tool to be used to achieve your objectives. Skip to the end point. Think about what can we do within the business that is being given to us top down that we can use bottom-up data, simple data, and we'll come on to that in a moment, what can we use bottom-up data to achieve? And my hint to you would be, don't even mention it as a data project. Don't mention it as a data project within your business. Just use data to do it. And the good thing is, if you do that, you end up with those middle bits anyway. So start, achieve something, Prove to your business that it's worthwhile doing. Move on to the next project. Move on to the next project. And after a period of time, you'll have all of that together. Because the stuff at the beginning are givens. They're the basic principles. But you need to think about what you need and why you need it. And you end up getting the middle part as a bonus. And we have seen that time and time again with the clients that we know who are doing this. Because um, there are some. They're just few and far between. So, barriers to data insights. We talked earlier on about simple things like, like actually downloading data. And that's because you have an environment at the moment of your systems, your people, your benefits, your 
people speak to your systems, your systems pe to speak to your benefit, maybe you get your people to do a survey, maybe. The most valuable information your people are chucking out, you don't get to touch, none of your business, you don't get to access any of that, but that's most valuable information they're chucking out. Maybe they interact with your benefits directly through some form of flex platform, and then all of that information goes off all to those different type of plans, right? That's basically the data flow within your organization, and that sits there, and that sits there, and never the twain shall meet. Okay? And that's a problem. That's the issue that you have. You need to find a partner, you need to find somebody who can help join those two bits up. And if you can't even download your benefits data properly, it's not going to happen. This is much more anecdotal than based upon evidence, but I know from having a conversation with lots of different clients that the number one reason they tell me that they don't end up doing this is time. It's bandwidth. It's actually being able to get it done. And when those two environments are separate like that, it makes it really hard. Okay, so these are the reasons that it's not really happening. And I don't see those fundamentally changing anytime soon, unless maybe you look at where this data lives and, 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 and how you can access it. So how data can transform your strategy? Uh, we've talked about efficiency, costs, business critical information. We've detailed about how costs are a massive impact on, on businesses at the moment and why it's very important. So this is something that came across. Don't have the ability to model benefit costs but think it would be highly effective. 84% of respondents to that. So that means most of you in this room don't have that ability at the moment. So if you want to turn around to your business and say, we want to change this, we want to... It, if you don't have the ability to model those cost changes, then how, can you, how, how easy is it for you to make that change? How easy is it for you to make that business case? That's a very difficult thing to do to support those business objectives. We also see this. 87% um, don't have the ability to allow new recruits to model explore. I've put this in because sometimes your business objective might be, we massively need to grow in this area and we need to hire a lot of people in this area and we're finding it quite difficult. Is that something that... You, you, you guys see sometimes in, in key areas maybe. We work with a couple of companies, it's a small number, massive international companies, where they have a platform that allows line managers to get the rec agreed to build the, the, the position in a system and essentially send that to the candidate directly with their own website, welcome to X, Y and Z, and that, put, that candidate can see their pay, their benefits, can select benefits in advance. We'd love you to come and work for us. This is what it's like. This is where you can split your shares and your income. This is where you can choose your different levels of medical insurance. We'd love to have you on board. That candidate presses that button and accepts that job offer. Done. Now that is the kind of stuff that allows technology to hugely impact the efficacy of what you're doing and gives amazing data to be able to speak to your colleagues as to what people are doing, what people are choosing, what people are selecting. So it is possible. It's not easy, but it is possible. What you end up with if you do this right is evidence. I said that that efficacy and ROI piece comes as standard once you start doing this properly. This is a case study from the US, client of ours, massive numbers, massive client, but the point is important. They're able to show, we know that on average this is what your business would have seen in terms of increases, and this is what we've achieved for you. So we have saved you a half a billion dollars over that period of time. Can we maybe get a little bit more for this other project that we would like to do? And once you've proven that efficacy, then you can start predicting the future with some confidence and with internal confidence. We believe we will be able to do this now in the future. We believe we'll be able to save that amount of money in the future. Because you've proven that you can do what you said you're going to do. Step by step, project by project. That's how you should look to do this. Now, I've talked about how important this is. I've talked about why it's not happening. I'm hoping that we can now take some steps towards helping it happen. Um, this is um, a little bit of fun. This is for me as much as it is for you. Um, this is a uh, non-commercial, library approved, no commission needing to be paid image that I believe represents football. Um, and I believe this represents 
two minutes before England go out of the Euros on penalties in the quarter-final. Uh, I think that was the, the AI prompt I used to generate that. Um, I, I must admit, this, uh, the session after me here is competing with an AI session, and let's face it, competing with AI is something we're all going to have to worry about in a little bit of time, but maybe that's for a different conversation. So this is football. Um, in one minute from the future of this, England are out of the Euros. What happens next? What happens next? We all make tea. As an entire country, we go and make tea. We go and turn the kettle on and make a cup of tea. What happens next? This is audience participation. Does anyone know what this is? If anyone gets this. It's a, it's a kind of a quarry. It's almost a quarry. Good shout. If anyone gets this, I, will, I, will, I, I can't do anything because of bribery and corruption rules. But anyway, I'll just give you a lot of admiration. This is the De Norwig Power Station, or Electric Mountain, as it's also known. This is in North Wales. I visited it when I was 14 years old, and I absolutely love this thing. So at the top of the De Norwig power station is a very large lake, and at the bottom of the De Norwig power station is a power station. So when we all go and turn our kettle on, they open a big tap at the bottom of that, all the water goes from the top to the bottom and generates a gigantic amount of electricity so that we don't basically have power cuts. And then they pump it all back up at the end of the day when power is cheap and they don't need it. I love it. I'm such a geek. But you know what this is? This is the absolute manifestation of predictable downstream actions after specific identifiable events. And you don't have anything as amazing as an electric mountain, but you do have understandable people within your business that are going to behave in predictable ways that you can use to improve how you connect with them. When something happens in terms of a life stage, you know what they're going to be likely to need or want. These are predictable downstream actions after specific identifiable events. Think about them. Input them into what you do. Little hint about where you might be able to access some of this, because a lot of it hides. It's not simple data. It's often in context. If you have internal working groups within your organizations, connect with them. Speak to single parent groups, speak to DNI groups, speak to social mobility groups, connect with them. Understand what about their context, understand about what their experiences, what, what their lived lives might just massively be improved by a small change in what you do. That isn't data, not easily accessible data, but it's massively important for context because making it personal makes it matter. That's basically what I stood up here a year ago and said. So, I think that's really important. This is one other thing I think you should be looking to do. Um, again, this is what I said a year ago. None of this changes very quickly, I'm afraid. Um, there is huge amounts of external research that is valid enough for you to be able to apply it to your business. Because one of the biggest challenges you have at the moment is you're not doing any of these things. So why are you not doing a lot of this? Because it's time, because you don't have the data, you don't have the information. Well, OK, let's just ignore that and use other people's work. I'm an inherently lazy person who loves standing on the shoulders of giants, and you have the ability to do that using external data sets. So, for example, this is the Financial Live survey from the Financial Conduct Authority. I love this data set, and you should learn to as well. You can download it. It's completely open source. You can get all of the spreadsheets. It splits questions by age, by gender, by socioeconomic group, by housing tenure, by racial profile. It's got so much information in there. So you can throw your data at that and say, right, OK, roughly speaking, this is how many people think they're in a worse financial situation, and this is how many people finding it difficult to cope. Now, you guys have been able to do that for ages, and you're not doing it at the moment, and we're putting tools together to allow us to apply lots of these different things to your data all at the same time, and if you want help, come and speak to me, but even so, you probably could and should be doing this. And there's other areas of research that allow you to do this. Menopause attrition. There's research showing how many people are likely to be suffering from menopause symptoms, which, by the way, will be staggeringly underreported because of the stigma of reporting them in the first place. 
but you can have a look at what that figure means, how many people are going to be impacted, how many people are, 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 are unhappy as a result, and how many people are going to leave your business as a result of that. You can have that kind of conversation. You can look at lost productivity to money worry. You can do all of these things using external research right now. Now, this one I think is quite interesting. Again, a year ago, I stood up here and talked about ROI. ROI, we've got to find the ROI. And you lot, everyone's scrabbling around, what's the ROI? It's not impossible to find the ROI for an awful lot of what we do because it's not afterwards, therefore, because of. It's very difficult to know that this particular thing happened because of that or this particular thing happened because we put that benefit in place. Small example of this, a long time ago I used to work with an engineering firm, had a number of different um, uh, sites over the UK. They ran a survey, the, um, the satisfaction, job satisfaction in one particular place absolutely plummeted and they're like, look, why is that happening? What's going on here? Uh, let's go and visit it and find out what's going on. And they basically said, well, um, actually the biggest problem has been roadworks. There was a bypass. 15 minute journey to work had turned into a 40 minute journey to work. That's basically what had happened. So you can't always understand this. And menopause attrition allowed me to have a conversation very recently with an employer about ROI. When I sat down with the finance director, male, HR director, female, sorry, it was very stereotypical, but it was true. And I sat there and I said, you told us uh, before we, we did this that, that cost was very important, uh, that cost was one of the biggest drivers. So I'm here to, uh, to say to you, you need to, you need to get rid of your menopause support. There's no, no, no reason for you to have menopause support. Oh, hang on, that's a bit awkward, isn't it? Sat there with the female HR director and the male finance director and the male finance director. That's a bit awkward. So we're going to do that, right? Because actually stated today, it was cost control. Oh, no. Turns out, actually, cost control wasn't the most important factor there. In that particular instance, what was doing the right thing was how they made decisions about what they were putting in place. So there are ways you can use data, ironically, to move the conversation away from evidence. Just a you know, very interesting interaction. So consider where you are, think about efficiencies, costs and EVP. Data supports your organizational objectives. Another little example here of what we're talking about. These are some of the things that we see people saying they find effective, saying they don't have. And I just wanted to highlight again just how little of these things organizations actually have the ability to do. So as a head of well-being, I want to reduce your overall anxiety today by telling you the things that you're worried that you're not doing, no one is doing. Thank you very much for your time, um, Andreas Hunter from Gallagher.